talk is about the benefits of baleage. And so I'm going to start. And uh, then Mike is going to talk a little bit about his personal experience from raising alfalfa. And I can honestly say that I haven't raised a bit of alfalfa, I'm a dairy nutritionist. And so um, what I'm going to do, if uh, I can master the clicker, is to go through a few of the things that I think makes baleage way better than haylage or dry hay. And one of uh, the, my old uh, farm clients today said, when I, when I told him where I was going to be and what I was going to be talking about, he said, well, baleage, that's poor man's haylage, isn't it? <laughs> and I, of course, I burst out laughing because, you know, I think that baleage has a lot of things going for it that are way better than haylage and dry hay. So, to me, baleage rules. It gives you better options because it can be really, really high quality feed. Now, I know a lot of people make baleage as a fallback when rain's coming, the weather's going to change, and I can't make dry hay. That is not high quality baleage at all. It never will be. Ba high quality baleage is done as a uh, effort that is planned out and you have an action plan to make it high quality. And right now, Baleage, if you looked across thousands of samples that Rock River Lab has run, baleage doesn't show its big advantage over haylage or dry hay, but I'll show you what it takes to make the, get those advantages. The biggest thing that baleage has is that it takes a lot shorter amount of time to get to a preserved feed. Okay, that it gets cooled down, fermented, and is stable. So if we talk about dry hay, dry hay sits out in the field for several days and the plant respirates. This is kind of review from what Dan Undersander talked about this morning. Haylage, on the other hand, you put it into a pile and the haylage sits for two weeks as that fermentation process happens. And with baleage, with baleage it's gonna ferment uh, quickly inside a plastic wrap and it's going to have an anaerobic fermentation. So it's going to get to a stable temperature and fully fermented in a week. Uh, so I put up here the Goldilocks moisture. We want to keep all the leaves on that alfalfa plant. So in my opinion, an ideal moisture or dry matter, take, take your pick, is 44 to 55. Mike, on the other hand, runs his dryer, but that's his farm philosophy. Um, what I believe is that the right moisture gets the baleage fermented most quickly. And I can tell you from experience and a lot of feed tests that wet baleage that's put up at the same moisture such as uh, haylage is, does not ferment quickly, and the reason is, is it has a lot more water. Water is 7.5 to 8 pH, and to make great baleage, we need it stable at 5 or below. So fermentation is not completed until the pH has come down to 5.0 or below. Uh, so that's why I said just right moisture gets it fermented quickly. If you have it very dry when it goes into a wrapped bale, it doesn't have very much uh, moisture to help it ferment, so it happens more slowly. Cut the right maturity. Use your cutting aids. So I brought up here with me a peak stick. A lot of research went into this. It has three sides on the peak stick. Uh, one is bud, one is flower, and one is vegetative. And a lot of companies including Pioneer, which this one happens to be, give these out free to farms to use. And you heard Dan Undersander's recommendation today, if it's 28 inches, cut it. Don't let it get any over 28 inches. So those are both good methods to use to, um, to get it cut right. Um, okay, the third thing, or the fourth thing on the bottom, be a soil conservationist. Leave it in the field. 
whenever you harvest dirt and it goes into the alfalfa or grass, whatever you are raising, it lowers the quality. If you know anything about uh, ethanol production, it's a big fermentation tank. And the thing that kills off that fermentation quicker than snot is dirt. And so the same thing goes with any ruminant that you're raising, whether it's beef cattle uh, or dairy cattle or deer or anything. If you have a fermentation going on in the rumen of the animal and you have dirt in there, it's going to lower the fermentation and the bacteria growth that's the helpful, beneficial bacteria that grow in the rumen. So that's why I say be a soil conservationist and figure out how not to harvest dirt, which Dan talked about um, this morning. So is it impossible to make great quality baleage? Well, we're getting there. We're covering some of the things. Baleage ferments quick if it's wrapped quick. And the samples that I'm going to show you, uh, two of those were baleage in one day. So from cutting till harvest wrapped and stored, it only was done in one day. Uh, wrapping excludes the enemy which is oxygen, and you heard Dan this morning talking about if you have any mold on a baleage bale, air got in some place. So that's a good lesson to use more wraps uh, of the same plastic the next time you wrap up baleage. The proof is in the preservation of sugar. When fermentation takes place, sugar is the first thing to be used for fermentation. That's the first energy to be used up. And so the advantage of baleage over haylage is the sugar content. If it's put up right, if it's just used as a fallback to uh, a dry hay option that didn't work out, you're not going to have a high sugar content. So if you look at thousands of samples that Rock River Lab has, no, the baleage sugar level isn't any higher on average than haylage is. But I'm going to show you exceptions where that was wrapped and all the sugar was preserved. So here's the first feed test, and I apologize that this isn't as clear on the screen as it was on my computer screen. But I'll just read you the numbers. Up at the top, it was 43.6 dry matter. So I consider that in the range of 44 to 55. The ash content on this uh, haylage was 6.67. So if you add up all the minerals that are listed there, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, that total is 4%. So we've got only 2% dirt. But Dan was talking this morning about 10% ash. And I'm a firm believer that there's nothing that should be harvested at 10% ash. That getting below 10% is going to improve the quality of the feed dramatically and improve the de fiber digestibility and the energy that the uh, animal that's eating it will, will reap. So now let's look at sugar content. Uh, the sugar content is 10.18 on this forage. And if you look over to the right, the lab average is 4.21. So that's a 6% plus advantage in sugar content. And that sugar is all energy. Uh, if you look down further, uh, the mid, right in the middle it says pH is 5.05, so this got fermented quickly. I always like to pro point out lactic acid and acetic acid, which are the two main fermentation acids that are created. This sample had a 1.5 lactic acid and a 0.85 acetic acid, and those are less than half of what the lab average is. So what I'm saying is, is the lab average included, includes all alfalfas like haylage, and there's a lot more fermentation acids, which takes a lot of energy and all the sugar that's in the plant to create that fermentation. So that's a big advantage to good baleage. This had an RFQ of 209. So to me, that's pretty impressive. It is possible to raise great, super quality baleage in one day. All right, I'm going to show another test. This is a clover sample from uh, St. Clair County. It's 44% uh, moisture. 
or dry matter rather, which is in the 44 to 55 range I talked about. Um, and it had 7.95% sugar. So this was a clover baleage first cutting and it had a RFQ of 179. So when you take 179 to 200 RFQ feed and feed it to dairy cows, holy cow, you could feed a lot of forage to those dairy cows and get really good production off of high quality baleage. I'm going to show you one more sample. This was off the same farm. This was 15% protein. Okay, some people would say, oh boy, 15% protein, hay isn't very high protein. Well, remember, when you have, everything is in percentage of dry matter. So if you increase the sugar content, everything else is going to go down. Who cares if the protein's at 15%? This has 12.5% sugar in it and it only has 5.9% 5. 5. ash. So we lowered the dirt, we raised the sugar content, and this had a 269 RFQ result. Now this is from another nutritionist in our team, and so uh, he moved to Idaho, and uh, is doing nutrition out there, and so when I, uh, inherited this client, I was talking with him and he said 269, uh, he said I had good baleage last year, 269, I said no you need 169 don't you? And he came back and showed me the sample that he had probably uh, stashed right in the milk house and uh, showed me how good a quality alfalfa he had put up. There had to be grass. There was grass, yes there was grass in this, you're, you're right. So. That's all I had, and we'll move on to Mike talking about his farm, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Eric is in the other session. Okay. You gonna drag him out of it? Uh, possibly. Okay. He was talking, so it might be a little bit.
on the edge that is wrapped and if it's deep inside the veil, you got specks of mold. My experience is that that's dirt that uh, we brought into it. Um, as far as hay quality, I agree there's there's no better feed out there. Um, hay haylage in a in a bunker, you know, you can't pack this hard, you're chopping it, you're blowing it, you're introducing oxygen to it every time you do that. When we're bailing baileys, we're bailing it, it's packed, it's sealed, it's done. And uh, that's why our fermentation process is so much quicker than, than chopped hay and, and two day, bunker day, and any of those. The fermentation curve will show you that um, in a week we're done fermenting. It's, it's, it's a cool product. It's, it's completely done fermenting. So, um, I guess I'd be open for questions. Um, if anyone has any? I mean, Bill? Mike, did you start at 25 to 3% when you got into No, we didn't. We started wetter because everybody said you had to do daily wetter. Um, and, if you put wet hay and dry hay in front of a cow, or you know, 40% moisture hay and, and 25 or 30, the cow will go for the wet stuff first every time. Um, so they probably will eat it a little bit better, but it, it doesn't pay the difference. The wrap is our biggest cost, so the more hay we can pack into that bale without the water, the less our costs are. So, and we can put up just as good baleage without it. The dairy farms are all feeding the high corn silage diet, which is a lot of moisture. They really don't need that extra water in there, so there's, there's no problem with them eating it. Good hay, a cow eat good hay every day of the year. Can you take us through your process of your cutting? And we cut. We cut with uh, wide self-propelled, drop it as wide as we can. We use a merger. A belt type merger, not a pine pickup type merger like the rock, or they'll use a, a fiber merger, which is a rubber belt with plastic tines on it that absolutely will not pick up a rock or, or really won't pick up dirt either. Um, we, we do that for hay quality. Um, and it drops a large, fluffy windrow. We can put, we can put four windrows together into one big square windrow. Key to baleage, to good baleage, one of the main keys is making a really square bale. If you go a big square to square bale, if you go round bales, a nice symmetrical bale because you can wrap it so much better. And it's all about forming windrow. If you have a perfect windrow, I don't care how you drive that tractor, you're going to have a perfect bale. It's just impossible. Or you'll have a bale that's soft on one side and you're going to get holes and problems there. So it's merged. We usually cut one day, merge it early the next day as soon as the dew's off and we're bailing by noon, one o'clock, depending on the, on the weather. In the summer, the second, third cutting, if it's lighter, we'll cut and bail sometimes the same day. Um, so I agree with all their things, so the quicker you get bailed, the higher your sugars are, the better the feed is. Yeah. And then uh, we used to wrap in the field, now we've got more wrapping at home. Um, if, if you're short of manpower, short of time, and you can wrap in the field, if you have a problem getting the job done, you're better off wrapping it in the field and leaving it there that day and picking it up the next day. If you're if you got enough manpower and everything to go and you can get it home and get it wrapped and stacked, you're better doing that because you'll put less holes in the plastic handling that bale and handling the bale 24 hours after it's wrapped. They say for 24 hours it will, the plastic has life in it yet. It still will contract when you squeeze it or when you handle it. And it's more forgiving when you're stacking and everything. If you're moving that bale a day or two later, you squeeze it with your squeezer, you just made an air void in there. And if that plastic can't recontract and, and take that up, you're, you're, you're creating a pocket in there. So if I tell everybody if they're short on manpower and they can only just get a bale to wrap that day, you're better off wrapping in the field and picking them up later. If you can get it all done in time, we found we're better off. When you're picking them up in the field, you don't have to be as careful and, as, and everything. And we're only handling it one time after we wrap it, so our risk of quite a full of or less. So it, it kind of depends on how you're set up um, to get it done. But what I see with people that wrap in the field sometimes, it's like our own bales all of a sudden a week later, they're still out there wrap and the hay's growing around them. And if they go and squeeze that bale then and move it, chances are they're going to have air pole problems with it. So, so. 
Um, our other speakers here, I'll let uh, Jeremy Eric talk. So. Okay. Mike does everything the right way. I know they go off on it. Trust me. <laughs> I've learned a lot. We've been doing it for 25 years. We were probably one of the first ones in the state to come in and do it. We uh, picked it up out of Europe. Uh, when we started, there wasn't much of a selection of bailers out there. We paid them using the roller baler, made four by four bales, they were squishy. So they do they settle. You wrap them, well one settle, one win. Next thing you know, you got ripped plastic. So that's where the uniformity bales is on lost. Through the years we've tried roller balers, belt balers, far slack balers. Uh, currently we run a chrome baler, far slack. Uh, we, this baler will be anything. It's got the chopper on it. This is so we ran 25,000 bales through this baler. We had a little bit of luck with it. The paint doesn't stay on very well. What can we bail? You know, we bailed it. I made a lot of storms and dance for our grass bed finishing in. Um, all hay. Everything we bail, everything we basically cut, we bail wet. We buy a lot of dry hay from the neighbors because it's cheaper to buy his nutrients off his field than sell our nutrients. So I got something I learned the hard way. So we, all my hay comes in dry hay. We do sell a little bit of square bales still to the horse customers because they've been lifelong like customers. So I don't want to shut them out totally. 12 foot wind rolls we use for it for our hay. Uh, we tried 12 foot wind rolls for our sorghum sedan and our corn, green leaf corn. It doesn't dry. It takes two to three days to get the moisture down. So we went back to a nine foot more sickle and we crimp it hard. That crimp, I actually do not move my roller spacing at all. The corn will make it through. My sorghum sedan will make it through. It might take a little bit of time, but you're squeezing some of the juice out. We've had guys on a sorghum sedan come back to the tractor totally wet. Because there's not much moisture in that sorghum sedan when we cut it. It, it does wet the mower and it will splatter the tractor. Oh, I'm kind of basically talking about this thing. Okay, we all, we use the inline wrapper, HS. We only single bills we wrap for the end caps. We found out that's the best to keep any mold from starting. The heart, we uh, wrap on a dirt pad, no gravel. We found out the holes and wrote it like the gravel, and they'll go and dig a hole that way. One place I have mold problems is with the cats. The cats jumping on the, ba the inline bale to get the moles and the mice. So we've had to eliminate a few cats over the years. Because it's always seen the same one. <laughs> I like I like the cats, but when you got mold between two bales, and technically if I can't sell that bale, and that bale's worth 50 bucks a piece, there's a hundred dollars right there. So with a hundred dollars, I also would rather wrap eight times than six. Because we said if you lose two bales, that'll pay for a roll of your wrap easily. And usually we got a mold here, you got a little mold here, and a little mold here, but that air goes through. Just trying to think of our experiences. Like I said, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I rewrap moisture wise. I wrap for one dairy. They want about 25 cents of moisture because they have to roll it out down on a free salt barn. They've had good luck with it. We had no problem with mold in that. I put the quality of feed is better when I put it up than when they did. So their milk price, their milk jumped up. They wish they could go back to the city breath moisture paint, but there's no way that their machine can handle it, put it, and actually roll it. So they have to hand roll it down the highway. So that's 
So that's a little unique factor there. Uh, I bail in the rain. I bail in a thunderstorm. Like I said before, you don't want to be in a thunderstorm with a tractor and a bailer. Because we got, we, got, we got close to about 300 feet from a tree we went to get. I jumped out of that tractor so fast you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but it was, we bailed all, we bailed it in the rain. And we opened the bales up. Water came out after we wrapped it. How did it? So, my dad always said they were getting a little drunk on it, but the <laughs> ferment, you know, the cows ate it, and we've never lost any problems with bailage. Mm, we don't do preservatives with ours. Never have. I don't see any need to. And do you like preservatives? Yes, I thought I remember seeing. He said it before you, but but I said we don't. We use the cell part of it. I don't sell much anymore. Uh, I do have deer guys come in every year. I might sell them one bale or two bales, roll off the truck. I always tell them to take the tailgate off. But one guy didn't, came back, the tailgate on his truck was bad. Uh, our current baler runs, we run between 1,800 and a ton of bale in our feed. So, kind of moisture. What size? Four by fives. I like four by fours, but I'm limited on space. Every year we keep adding more and more. I think this year we'll probably add them to we'll close to 2,000 rounds all wrapped. So Eric, we could stop and do questions. Yeah. Do you seal the end of your line when you finish? Yes, that's what we do with individual wrap bales. That's what we found out. When we first started, we ran two bales, dry bales, then two on the other end. I found out. I tried bale caps. I like individual rat bales. If you get some drier stuff, I, I recommend that for your rat for your ends. Because they I will wrap 20, 30 at the beginning of the summer. Then if I don't like to feed, we got we keep extra cover. All plants and root cows, they get all their bad feed. They don't complain, they're nice and fat. But that's why I found out the best so far for stealing the end caps. Because you always, with those two bales, we always end up getting two more down the line that we're moving, just because the air flow through the regular way. But <coughs> I'm sure they'll say the same thing. Pack those bales as hard as you can possibly get them. That's the main objective. What kind of bale? We use chrome right now, modern slab. And I have run tree stumps through it. Uh, my, dad, my dad would tend to see the, take a six, a six block. To extend the mower, to extend the mower arm out, put the behind the wheel. Well, he had to forget about that block. I'll be going through, boom! Guess what I just found? And I go back and where's the block going down the field? Well, no, it's not. Now we've had them caught in the, our rotor cutter. We have to take the same saw and cut them in pieces to get them out. It never did them anything, so. I've caught a, we see a, we caught a couple of gophers all over, so. Which else we've gotten? Uh, snakes. That's how we were one day. I was cleaning out a bale one time and we plugged up. There was a snake. Made it through the cutter. It scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else?